Welcome to the At The Coalface podcast with your host, Jason Greenwood. This podcast is all about what it's really like in the trenches of digital and e-commerce. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the At The Coalface podcast with me, Jason Greenwood, your host. And it is my distinct privilege to welcome to the podcast, Mr. Oliver Rhodes. Thanks for being here, my friend. You're welcome. How are you doing, Jason? Doing really good, mate. Dialing in all the way from mighty England. And uh, yeah, so we obviously it's the very start of your day and the, and the very end of my day. It's about 8 p.m. my time. Yeah, we're at 9 a.m. here. That's the beauty of the interwebs. Yeah, I've made it. I've made it work for the last sort of five, six years doing UK, Australia, New Zealand stuff. So yeah, first thing and then end of day, as late as you dare to go, really. Yeah, that that's exactly right. I, I I'm doing very much the same thing. I got a client in Ireland, so uh, yeah, it makes for fun fun <laughs> Zoom call times. That's for sure. But uh, mate, we we've known each other for I'm 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 gonna do some back of the napkin math here, and I think we've I think we've known each other for about five, maybe coming on six years now. And uh, actually, yeah, about six years now. And I actually met you as a client of PeopleVox when you were still with PeopleVox. PeopleVox being a very well known e-commerce WMS or warehouse management system. And that's how we got to know each other. Yeah, I remember I remember a contact form coming in from a Jason Greenwood and checking out a health post you were with at the time and just yep. checking out uh, what it was about and getting on a call with you and thinking, my God, this guy's got a lot of energy for what you were doing. And I still <laughs> talk to people about that program schematic. You were putting all these different solutions together and I'd never seen anything as comprehensive in terms of how it was put together. And I also thought you were mental. And <laughs> um, and the combination of those two things. And obviously we got involved in that project and um, by all accounts, it was a massive success. So yeah, that was my, uh, that was my intro to Jason Greenwood. Does things that uh, other other people wouldn't dare to do. Oh, thanks, mate. I've I've sort of tried to my my career is pockmarked with scenarios like that where you know the, it takes a little bit of uh, craziness to to get certain things over the line and to you know sometimes maybe biting even off a little more than you think you can chew, but you make it work. And yeah, it was certainly an exciting time, and and I was really impressed with your level of knowledge and passion for supply chain and logistics and warehousing. And you know, I I never really pre pre you, I never really thought that part of the industry was sexy, to be honest. Uh, I knew it was a critical part of the industry, but I never really thought it was sexy. But you really, um, I guess, showed me that side of the industry and how and not only how critical and mission critical it was, but how the tech differs so greatly. So obviously I had a, a deep background in, in ERP, CRM, e-com tech, and a whole bunch of other things, but I didn't really have hardly any experience with dedicated WMS platforms at that time. And you really helped me get excited about both just just the the industry in general people vox specifically you were pretty much the perfect prototypical sales guy in the sense that you were just passionate about the industry you were passionate about what you were doing and it was really infectious and uh you know we did have a fantastic project you know it ended up implementing uh, netsuite end to end and people vox end to end and a whole bunch of other cool tech uh, that's still in operation today at, uh, at health post running the business very successfully and scaling very successfully so um that's that's kind of how we got to know each other and it was a, it was a really fun time wasn't it yeah it was good and i think the warehouse piece like you couldn't really see it at the time but it, that was where it was starting to have its day a little bit there was this wave where everybody knew amazon was up to stuff in terms of robotics and everything and i think that served as a bit of distraction for a lot of people because they saw like this futuristic where where everything was going and all of these like automated robots that are coming through now for like third party logistics companies that are doing tens of or hundreds of thousands of orders every single day. The massive growth in e-commerce or the, the tidal wave has really been SME brands like starting up, scaling up like digitally native from day, you know, from day one, they're just hopping on Shopify or big commerce or whatever, building a brand, building a community and an audience, and they need to be able to service their customers. That was where we started to play as the kind of the, the back end bit that meant people could deliver on all the all the flash sales and the craziness that they could generate with the demand side. And yeah, I think it's I think it's now had its time. Like I remember when we started, we said that nobody knew what a WMS was in e-commerce. And I think that that was true. I wouldn't say that is true now. Like there's relatively good knowledge within companies, operational leaders moving around, still never enough of them, but there's people with good knowledge of what a WMS is now. 
There certainly is, and and I couldn't agree with you more. I think you know, and it, it, I feel like PIMS and CDPs are having their WMS moment now. So you know, uh, WMSs, you know, four, five, six years ago, you know, you were out there being an evangelist for the industry as a whole, and telling, and teaching, and showing, and demonstrating how ecom brands could take control of at least their internal supply chain and deliver an amazing customer experience through fulfillment and and really that whole experience apart from the last mile bit which is usually outside the merchant's hands anyway mm. uh and i feel like that you're right I, I feel like i bump into more and more businesses now that are even using that acronym wms and saying we're you know we're we're on the hunt for our, our next wms because we need to fill this problem that problem this problem we're scaling and blah 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 so but you're right i think that you know our industry goes through waves and i think cdp customer data platforms having their, their minute in the sun right now absolutely with the impending death of third-party cookies and the changes with iOS. And then we have PIM, right? Product information management, absolutely having its day in the sun as brands take control of their product data and need to slice and dice it for a hundred different channels uh, in unique ways. And they don't want to do that within each channel manually or via some connector mapping platform that that is a, a mare to manage. So I totally agree with you. And I think, you know, after you're over a decade at PeopleVox, you know, you were a founding employee of the company, shareholder in the company. When the company was sold to Descartes, obviously you had a nice exit with the with the with the founder of the company as well and the and the founding employees, you all had a pretty good exit out of the business, which is totally well deserved and well earned after over a decade of seriously hard slog. And now you're at Supply Compass. Yeah, it was a uh, it was a short short ten years at PeopleBox. It was my first real gig. I'd say the biggest well, the thing that served me the best was focusing on trying to become an expert in e-commerce rather than just thinking about being an expert in the thing that I was selling. And I think this is one of the biggest mistakes that salespeople make in the e-commerce space they obsess at becoming very good at understanding their product and what it does on the other side of it you've got the people working in tech for brands or just an e-commerce manager or a founder who's not been here before they don't know how the e-commerce landscapes evolved over the last five six years everything's completely fresh to them they're trying to work it all out and when they come and speak to you if all you can do is talk about your specific problem and in our case it was getting orders out the door and having accurate inventory at PeopleVox. if that wasn't the number one thing on their list it'd be thank you very much i'm too busy for this goodbye if you focus on being a trusted advisor when they speak to you and you understand like you have to understand the ecosystem and have that obsession for all the different you know I, I like the new and shiny and if you've got that obsession for all the new and shiny things coming through and you're naturally curious and that's probably a better way to put it like just being naturally curious about how all the different technology fits together and then also listening to what's working for other brands you know this is one of the advantages that we have right if you speak to 20 20 new companies a week and you hear the good the bad and the ugly you can take that and within a period of two three years you've had the experience you know relative experience experience of someone who's been in one company for you know, you'd have to have a 40 year career to see that much behind the scenes that's the advantage that i think think are deployed well at PeopleVox. And certainly this is like one of the parts where we've got along really well. And then coming to the end of that, we were acquired by Descartes in February last year. It was a great, um, great exit for, for the company. It set us up to go and launch like really properly in the US. And we had really amazing growth last year with um, having the right foundation in place, scaling the team through Descartes and and the surge in, in e-commerce fulfillment through you know through COVID. We were doing in April last year, we were doing Black Friday, Cyber Monday volumes from the year before, which is just bonkers. And then yeah, coming toward kind of the back end of last year, well, middle of last year, back end of last year, I started to look at where else I could possibly go next. And um, I tell you, it's not easy when you've been somewhere for 10, 11 years trying to think what you're going to go and do next, because the company very much becomes your identity, particularly when you've got a piece of it. You start to find it very hard to separate the two. And fortunately for me, it was a success, which then you know, made me uh, by association feel like a success, like rightly or wrongly. And then it it was a case of thinking what next and um I, what i tried to do is look past the obvious trend in the market of what's hot right now and try to look a step beyond to see what might be coming through as a next uh, important wave of technology that companies need because like key for me and this is a big reason i joined supply compass was to find a company at, at an early enough stage you know i realized particularly when like post acquisition how much of a more of a startup type person i was 
um, and how much I enjoy that environment. I'm now I'm in it. I'm you know question that every day. I, I'm actually mental. But being back in somewhere like going at speed, but working on something where you you can start to be you know take on that evangelical role and start to talk about things that not everybody's talking about but you're really catching a few early adopters with the way that we're positioning the product as something new in a different way of, of approaching a really old set of problems related to supply chain man what a story and i totally agree with you you know I, i've been watching you from afar as you've transitioned and in that in between time where you had some downtime you were putting out some cracking content on linkedin about sort of lots of lots of stuff it wasn't just about sales but it was mostly sales focused and it was you were sharing a lot of i guess gifts and nuggets from the trenches over the last decade with people vox and and i i was getting fired up i was getting excited about you know selling product and, and, you know, the whole, you know, I've been in, I've been a hardcore proponent of SaaS for a long time, but just t you talking about and sharing lessons from your sales journey over the last decade, it was exciting to me. And I'm not, I'm not a hardcore sales guy. Like, like I'm a, I'm a, yeah, I, I guess I'm a natural born salesperson in the sense that I just purely talk about stuff that I'm, I'm passionate about. And, and that tends to get other people excited about it too. And, and I love taking people on that journey to your point. I think you're right. I think people in our industry oftentimes completely miss the point or maybe the point for them is different than it is for us is probably a better way to say it which is mm -hmm. me i'm passionate about every single aspect of this industry now i tend to be more technically inclined so therefore the shiny stuff for me is the is the is more the technical side of things and how that works with brand and how that works with customer experience and how that integrates in with other systems to create that seamless customer journey but i'm i'm passionate about the whole lot and and i love talking to people that are passionate about their bit of it um and and i think that you're right i think the people of the future in our industry that are going to make their mark are people that are generalists uh, not necessarily specialists because a lot of the specialties are getting commoditized. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as a result of that, I think people that have a broader view of our industry, because it's always changing, right? Um, and the things you thought you knew yesterday, yeah, sure, you can, you can apply those patterns to the future, um, but there's going to be massive differences tomorrow. So I totally am on the bandwagon with you. Now, if I was to des des describe Supply Compass based on what's on the tin, and based on what I've seen of you and what you've talked about it, it feels like a three-pronged approach to a few really big problems in e-commerce and in our space. One is you know, a product lifecycle management platform. One is a supplier marketplace effectively where you can connect buyers and sellers and then a vendor management platform for merchants that are working with suppliers and manufacturers to get their goods to them and, and a collaboration platform to allow those merchants and those suppliers and manufacturers to communicate to each other through a centralized platform that facilitates that communication. So it feels like almost like a Swiss army knife, but all focused on product, all focused on the product life cycle, all the way from design, procurement and fulfillment and everything in between in an all in one platform. Would I, is that a reasonably accurate description of the platform or where have I got it wrong? I go with that. I think part of the challenge that we have is, like you said, it's got a few prongs to the approach. And what we always try and do is like relate it back to something that already exists and people want to make comparisons. And also when people are buying software, they want to be able to chuck you in a bucket, right? So they can go, oh, I'm looking at these two products and they need a third to consider. It's really handy if you just slip into an into a bucket, you know, to relate that back to my PeopleVox experience. When we started, nobody was looking for WMS and it was really, really hard. And then over a period of five, six years, people started looking for a warehouse management system. Once that started to happen, God, it was so much easier to get referrals and for people to talk about you. The existing technology in the space that's most most deployed and talked about is that is that PLM, the product lifecycle management software. Like specifically with Supply Compass, we're focusing on like fashion brands. So brands that are sourcing their own product and we're helping them manage the entire process from the point of inception. So literally that, you know, they're creating mood boards on our platform rather than using Pinterest, following that process all the way through to the point of delivery date. And along that journey of a, of a style, yeah, we call it a style versus a product. Along that journey of a style, I am absolutely dumbfounded at the number of different tools and spreadsheets and emails and WeChats and WhatsApps that are taking place. You know, to the extent that if it was 
uh, if that technology was being used to run a warehouse, you'd walk into the warehouse and you would just go, this is just no, 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 we can't be doing this because you would see how bad it all is. You could just see it, right? Because you'd see people like walking back and forth over and over and over again. You'd be like, why are you doing that? This is just crazy. But what you've got is a status quo in fashion production, which is delays are inevitable, mistakes are inevitable, and brands chase suppliers nonstop on email and WhatsApp for updates. And And also it's a and also it's sorry to interrupt it also it's a super fast moving space right so you've got you've got seasons you know you've got seasonality you've got hemispheres uh with different seasons in the different hemispheres you've got release cycles you've got drops you've got design then you got manufacturing then you've got you know brands like zara and a few others which are running just on just in time manufacturing around their 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 fast fashion and they're literally getting feedback from the sales floor direct to the manufacturer and changing designs and creating new designs within 48 hours and and getting it to ship out from the factory in less than mm-hmm. a week so it's a crazy it's a crazy vertical right it feels totally like the wild west if you if you if you weren't aware of it and you you didn't sort of grow up in the space you you know and and I've got clients in this space and and my first exposure to a proper PLM platform was was with a re- recent client engagement and and I had never had to do a search and select for a PLM before I'd never had to figure out how to integrate it in with PIM and ERP and everything else and 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 so that that was my trial by fire education was and they're in the fashion industry so they had to have a PLM mm. and man it is a unique beast that vertical of fashion yeah and it, like to, to let's just take take PLM as a starting point I think PLM like ERP and WMS once they're kind of categorized and you know it's a project right it's a it's a it's an implementation it's training it tends to mean it's going to become a kind of single source of truth for some form of data in the you know, in the data integration model in a business it also means it's going to sit on a technology roadmap and it's going to be deployed at some point, depending on the priorities of the business. And so what you've tended to see with PLM is that it actually comes in after ERP as a follow on project. M- most often, that's that's the scenario that I've seen. But ERP isn't something that brands are starting out with. More and more, we're seeing brands scale even bigger you know, pre ERP, right? There's no no requirement to put one in at any particular stage. There's no clear financial indicating milestone that now's the time to do it. It depends on so many different factors. So there's like the PLM spot, but PLM as a concept is very, uh, very much focused on the product lifecycle. Uh, the best illustration that I've had of this uh, was with a, a UK brand where the CEO mapped their entire product journey from the point of like n- initial idea and planning all the way through to delivery. He did it in a Miro board, which is a really great collaboration platform if anyone's tried it. But he put out the yep. post-it notes from start to finish of every step in the process. And underneath, he did a, a post-it note for every system or tech that was used. So it'd be like Google Sheet, different Google Sheet, third Google Sheet, that goes on an email. We, we use our PLM for this part and this part and this part. And there were probably 40 post-it notes and the PLM covered four of them. And yes, so- that's a that's a common. That's actually the same scenario I ran into as as well with this with this client engagement. Is they were you know and they they had a they didn't have a PLM and they were what they thought they needed a PLM, but what they needed was both a PLM and a PIM. And knew you were going to yeah. say PIM. Knew you were going to yeah. say they needed a PIM as well. Hundred percent. They had, they had to have it. They had they yeah, they, they just there was there was no chance for them not to have it in in their particular model and, and the way that they did things. But pre a new PLM and PIM they were doing so much in, in Google Sheets and in many other systems, like you say, and, and emails and the different communication and, and actually using Miro as well, plus using the Adobe design suite for the actual mm. ideation and the product design. It was, it's, it's fun- the level of complexity in the space is insane. And the distributed systems that are at use are insane. And each, each factory oftentimes will use a slightly different design system or a slightly different mm. manufacturing process or a slightly different bit of machinery or kit or even a different WMS of the way that they fulfill and ship stuff out. So it is a it is a minefield. So the fact that Supply Compass is kind of taking this whole thing on as as this big, you know, it's the BHAG, you know, it's the it's the big hairy audacious goal of something to to solve for. It's 
man, you've 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 jumped right in the deep end, haven't you? We're in pretty deep, but it's um it's on a ground it's on a grounding of good insight into the manufacturer side, which is which is what's driven a lot of a lot of the focus on, on the whole rather than just thinking about a few steps in the process and you know solving something for designers yeah you know, there's yeah you know, there's plenty of of good good plms out there there's good you know modern plms that have been built web based and look great and are easy to use so there's no there's no different to be had in going and doing that but there's also some some other bigger opportunities looking outside of plm and that's where we're trying to build something you know very different we we're constantly assessing ourselves. You know, we we think we can actually work alongside PLM. We've got brands that are using some of the biggest enterprise PLMs, and they say to us, you know, we're actually happy with the core, you know, the four post-it notes that the PLM covers, but we're really looking at supply compasses more than that. And the more than that that they're looking towards is this uh, this collaboration. And the reason that we're so big on collaboration is because as as the company from when it was founded by Gus and Flora, the two co-founders, Gus is the CEO and Flora is the head of product. Um, they actually founded the company in India. In its early infancy, they set out to build a digital outsourcing agency. And what I loved about that was with as a digital outsourcing agency, they sat in between the brand and the manufacturer and they learned all about the people on the manufacturer side, they understood the process that goes on between the brand and the manufacturer. And that's what drove all the insight to to say, right, there's no point just solving the internal problem, which is what PLM has been doing. You know, PLM has been make a better tech pack. If you make a perfect tech pack, the manufacturer won't make a mistake. That's the logic that goes with it. But as soon as you take that tech pack and you put it on an email and then the email goes over to the factory and then they make a comment or something goes on the email, then it comes back and then you need a new version of the tech pack and then that needs to be sent across. Or I've heard people who run factories saying, I'll get a few messages on WhatsApp and then they'll be like, change this or change that. And then it doesn't go in the production run. And so that's where the mistakes are happening. The mistakes and delays take place. You know, whether it's caused by an internal issue on the brand side or whether it's something that the factory does, mistakes cost everybody a ton of money. It costs the factory loads of money that they can't afford because they're on much lower margins than the brands are working to. It costs the brand an insane amount of opportunity in terms of missed sales because they've not so- sorted that whole piece out. So recognizing that you know and this is the hard the hardest part of of what we're doing here is that we really believe that accurate data needs to be driven by data from both sides the brand and the, and the manufacturer inherent in that is that you need to get your factory your manufacturers on board and using the platform to have shared accurate data and then using that shared accurate data we drive shared workflows that go between the factory and the brand to deliver some best practice around production and that then gives accountability because either side knows exactly what's going on and through that you're delivering trust and you know if we can start to drive some accountability people can start to build trust they're not having to focus on the transactional stuff you know the the little email updates the updated tech back the comments back and forth they don't have to do all that transactional stuff they've got more time to focus on the relationship building and that's where the true collaboration can start to happen people are working towards shared goals and an important part of this whole story is the drive across almost every fashion brand that I've spoken to towards improving their manufacturing and their production with some more sustainable principles embedded into it in whatever way they understand those to be. So in my experience, most design will start in something like Adobe Illustrator from from yep. like the, the concept. And oftentimes, even the tech pack is actually built out in Illustrator in many instances. Yeah. Um, you know, including the spec sheets and the, the swing tags and absolutely everything, you know, the boxing, the the packaging, almost everything is oftentimes built out in, in Illustrator because, you know, we, we, you know, when we think of a piece of fashion, for example, there's a lot more to that piece of fashion than just that bit of fabric or that color or that, you know, there's so much to it. It's such a complex thing. You've got all the wrapping and you've got the, the, what it ships in the inners, the outers, mm-hmm. you've got, you just, there's just so much involved. It's, it's ridiculous. But if we, take the 50,000 foot view of this and we say, okay, what does supply compass do, do? Just walk us through the literally the helicopter view of the point from inception 
in Illustrator just for the sake of argument. Mm -hmm. And it, does that mean that Supply Compass integrates with Illustrator and that's where the integration begins of the, the concept of a product? The short answer to that is no, not at the moment. Like lots of PLMs have gone down the route of integrating with Illustrator because that's where the design work's being done. Mm -hmm. I think there's opportunity for us to go and do that in the future. But our priority has been building out the whole like the end to end and a big part of that was off the feedback from many brands that they're happy with the way that they currently do their tech packs there's kind of two two groups of people like lots who are ready to kind of ditch their existing tech packs move their data across you know in order to build a tech pack out in another platform you're going to have to build out like some material libraries and component libraries and that kind of thing. And there's going to be a significant change to the way that you're working, particularly as designers. Obviously, integrating with Illustrator can help you to do that a little bit better. There's time here. Yeah. Take, takes time to get to get that stuff set up and then moved across. And the, the other use case that we're seeing is brands that want to go much more quickly. And for them, it's more about, you know, well, I'm happy with the way that I'm doing my tech packs right now. I can think of one French brand we're working with where they're happy with that. But actually, the most important thing for them to start with is to get a bit more visibility over the end to end process. And that's around like the critical path management is probably the way to describe it. And that is 99 times out of 100 an excel sheet that the buyer or the production lead manages with all the different steps in the production process you know, marking the handoff of all those different steps between different departments and what you'll also find is in bigger teams you know you'll have three or four versions of this same excel sheet and then you've got someone who's the operations lead that has to collate all of this information together in order for them to actually do any kind of reporting on the progress of everything that's going through uh, a styles journey at any point in time so that's where we've done things a little bit differently. We cater to like both both sets of customer groups. Our real strength on the design-led side has been around how we've built out the sampling and approvals workflow. The like this concept of you know sampling, which you don't often think about when you're buying clothes. I certainly didn't think about it. But pretty much everything you've met you're wearing that's of any good quality, I think that's a really important part to this. Like great quality is usually driven by having multiple iterations. And if you think that you've got usually a brand in one country and a factory on the other side of the world, through the last couple of years, you may even have a designer, a producer, and someone working in a factory, a merchandiser, and a, a team there who actually create the garments, do the making, who have never met. So you've got these people that haven't really worked together very much. Much. And what you need to try and drive through them is an iterative design process with multiple feedback loops and ensure that at every step of that uh, feedback loop, you're capturing all the information. It's all being taken on board and then it's all going into the next iteration of the product. And the iterations of the product in fashion are called the samples. So what brands will do is come up with an initial design and they'll sample on things like material, they'll sample components, they'll sample uh, the fit is a really important thing. They'll also sample like the blocks, so the cutout, the shape of the garment. Yeah, you know, These are things that I, I had absolutely no idea about. You know, when I was doing warehousing, I just thought that um, you just had a, you just raised a purchase order for your product and the stuff got shipped to you, right? That was pretty much the extent of my knowledge. Um, but then understanding all these different bits that happen and the standard way of sampling is literally just Excel sheets and this sample tracking thing that goes on is just insane. Um, so one of the coolest things I think we've done is take, rather than just building out tech packs in supply compass for the sake of having a pretty tech pack right we actually use the building out of the tech packs to drive an e-commerce like experience within the app for ordering samples so when you're in the platform if you look at a particular style you can click on you know i want to sample this in a size small and a medium and i want to sample this particular material and could you give me a couple of options on on another part of it two different components for example and you can click on them put them through into your e-commerce checkout and all of the design of the platform has been done by someone from an e-commerce background which i love thinking about when people are using the product how can we make it super super accessible so they can just pick it up and use it when you log in that sampling order process is like buying online and then because it's like the online experience when you place your order you've got like a sample order history of everything that you've ordered but then the magic happens for me on the other side 
from the manufacturer's perspective, rather than them looking at an inbox of, you know, and they get hundreds of emails a day, you know, some very useful emails, some just chasing for more information. So they're trying to filter through all this noise. What the platform does is take all of those sample orders, completely separate them across into a sample order inbox within the manufacturer's platform. And the manufacturers, they told us they like working in this Kanban style, you know, a little bit like a Trello board. So from yep. the brand's perspective, when you place your sample orders, everything goes across and then you're working on this, the factory's working on this Kanban. That from that point on, all the back and forth, you know, with, with all these steps between the, di I know you love digital and physical, but the, the production sampling process is all these steps between the physical and the digital. A digital design goes across, a physical product gets made. You then confirm digitally what's been made, ideally with a photo submission. And then it goes across to the brand side. You know, it gets shipped around the world. You know, there's time involved in that. There's cost involved in that. And, you know, small things just get picked up by having a much better process. For example, if you, if you make submitting a photo submission a rule rather than a nice to have, you see that the logo is upside down and you're like, no, 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 no. Logo is clearly in the wrong spot here. Please don't bother sending that sample. And then from a brand side, that means the unboxing experience on the samples is significantly better on a more consistent basis because they don't get sent the samples where they're like, oh my God, what have they done here? This is nowhere near what we wanted to do. And as you increase the um, productivity of sampling, it then means brands can do more samples to get towards higher quality product which reduces the mistakes in the actual production run. At the end of the day, I really believe in fashion in particular, the quality of the product is what's going to win out for you over a period of time. Are people going to come back and buy a product um, over and over again and start to rely and trust on a brand? If the product's not up to scratch, does it meet that expectation? And having a great sampling and design process is actually what sits at the core of that. So, I mean, it sounds to me like if I was to, to wrap that beautiful chat up into a nutshell, it is the, the concept of fast fashion being brought to slow fashion. In other words, historically, you know, the fast fashion space has been tolerant or at least fast fashion customers have typically expected their products to be dirt cheap. They've expected them to be uh, ubiquitous. They've expected them to be on trend and they've expected them to be almost disposable clothes. Right. And and they wear them 10 times and then they're worn out and they throw them away and they're ready for for a change of their wardrobe anyway. And so we've got this kind of idea of fast fashion, which is which has gotten a bad rap and a bad name in many cases, justifiably for environmental damage and, and you know, slavery, you know, modern slavery and all the rest. But then we've got slow fashion, which is more timeless pieces by more timeless manufacturers. And obviously, mm. by definition, they have to put a lot more time into the design process. They have to put a lot better quality materials into it. They it, it takes longer to manufacture. It takes longer to ship. There's more sampling involved. So really what you're trying to do is you're trying to bring the rigor of higher quality, slow fashion, slower fashion. You're trying to bring that same process and the rigor and the I guess the, the quality quotient around that, and you're trying to wrap that around an industry that is increasingly speeding up. That's a lovely way to put it. And it, I think the reason it's speeding up is external factors. It has sped up for sure. Like you were talking, you mentioned before about like the concept of seasons and things like very, very few new brands think in seasons. They're yep. thinking in drop. The yep. dropping of new styles is an event. And that is the absolute best form of um, best fuel you can have for your marketing efforts is to have new styles dropping all the time around yep. which you can drive attention. You can get eyeballs on your product because you're doing something new and innovative with products. And even the brands that do work at a ridiculous pace and cut corners on quality, they all want to be more design led in what they're doing. They all want better quality product if they can do it. Yep. And for some of them, it's about kind of trying to make a trying to you know, make some gains. But I, actually, the thing that we're saying across all of this is that even the brands that are working more slowly in a more conscious way, there's huge gains to be had for them through collaborating more closely with their manufacturers. When you consider the whole of a supply chain and the leading brands already use collaboration to win. You mentioned Zara before, you know, hu huge folk, whether you like them or not from her fashion perspective, huge focus on collaboration in their supply chain, which has given them adva an advantage. You got someone like Allbirds as well. They also have a big focus on collaboration in their supply chain chain 
Patagonia is another really famous example. What I'm finding as well is that there are a lot of other brands that really believe that collaboration is the key to them having a better supply chain and better means higher quality product at a reasonable cost delivered on time. What you'll find is that the status quo is that many brands ditch one or two of those requirements. So they say, okay, we're not going to worry about quality. Let's focus on cost and speed, but they still can't nail the two they go for. Do you remember, you know, that triangle of you got to pick two? <laughs> yes. The, the, <laughs> and they the can't even get the two in, that they're focusing on. Yeah. Well, the, the mandate in production is that you, you try and hit all three, but you know, there's usually one that you, you try and put over all the others what i'm saying is brands focusing on you know say you've spoken on speed and cost and then they end up air freighting product last minute and the cost of the air freight goes from 50p to two pounds per garment because they ended up air freighting it last minute and it still came late and the quality wasn't there because they didn't approve you know they didn't do an extra round of sampling to get the fit right so they've done they've missed all three um and at the end of the day Uh, The customer loses, the brand loses in that scenario. And it's the worst outcome from a sustainability perspective because we've cut we've cut all the corners and we've still ended up with bad product and we've we've made decisions that that aren't the most environmentally sound. So, you know, if you take take some of those companies from our perspective, we're really thinking, well, if we can help help them get it right up front so that they're more organized, even though they're operating at speed, can we bring better quality into their process? And can we help them get stuff you know, prepared and ready on time? Because they may not, they may not decide to, um, they may not decide it's important from an environmental standpoint, not to air freight the product. But if it's a margin protection thing, then they're very much interested in that because they want to keep their landed costs down and hit their target margin. Well, well, they have to, right? Because their entire business model is predicated on it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they've, they've, got pl- they've got plenty of margin to play with. But yeah, to hit the target margin, which is what the merchandisers and the buyers care about, that's the, that's the hardest part. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, an, it's a super complex challenge. You know, I'm only six months into it. And you know, you know what I'm like. I'm obsessed about learning about the space. What's kind of frightening for me in a, in a way is that I feel even though I'm six months into this, particularly in terms of learning about sustainability and what that means and looking into some of the leading you know, thinkers in the space, how much more I know at this stage than, say, you know, many people running apparel brands in e-commerce. I think there's a you know, similar thing to there's so many there's so many areas of knowledge that you have to you have to dig into and i actually found like probably the most daunting part of the job was that there's you can't be in fashion at the moment without thinking about sustainability in some ways it's really is table stakes for a brand now to have some to at least worked out where you stand on sustainability whether you're going to acknowledge it or not or whether you're going to talk about it um, and it is really hard for the founders of brands um, who aren't you know setting out completely for focused on that as like their you know their vision thing is quite daunting to get into it and even to be you know, even now talking to you about it I'm having to think about what I'm saying or what I'm not saying about the subject because the the short answer is like nobody 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 really understands it fully and on the and actually nothing is sustainable is the conclusion that you start to come to and and it feels overwhelming right it feels overwhelming and it feels like where do i begin yeah exactly overwhelming and, where do i know, begin and, yeah i mean i guess it comes down to sorry to interrupt i guess, I guess it comes down to the the concept of a consumer society right and i guess if we can help move the needle towards a, a more sustainable future by simply creating better quality products that last longer sure they may cost a little bit more but if the sustainability credentials become a selling point for the brand and as you say it is it's table stakes but there's table stakes of lip service and then there's and then there's actually doing it right so i think i think lip service is the table stakes bit but actually doing something about it is the hard mm. bit and and it feels like supply compass is one tool in the tool chest that can help brands bring costs down, um, not have wasted production runs that need to be thrown away because there was a stupid error that slipped through um, sampling, et cetera, et cetera. There's, it feels like there's a role for supply companies to play in the sustainability efforts of these fast fashion and slow fashion brands for that matter. Um, because the, because the, the quote unquote slow fashion brands, even they're speeding up, right? So they're doing, they're moving to a drop concept, you know, you know, you, you, as you rightly pointed out, that is what is driving the marketing. That's what's driving the social media. You know, if we look at 
We look at two of the biggest, you know, fashion players out there in the social media space with Sheehan and Fashion Nova. You know, mm. you look at them and and they're absolutely fast fast fashion players. But even they're having to start weaving some token discussion about sustainability into their narrative. They are, yeah. Ultimately, they are mass market brands. When you go into mass market, you're going to be driven by like the lowest cost possible, and so they will they will prioritize you know low cost and speed to market over quality. That's that's the business model that they're in. Along that journey to get those products to market, it's how can we help eliminate any wastage? I'm not necessarily saying that we can we can help the two brands that you've mentioned, but particularly for like smaller brands kind of in that f- 5 to 100 million or even a little bit smaller, how can they how can they gain a lot of advantages through collaborating with suppliers for all the different reasons? And a lot of them already are. Yeah, you know, if you actually take the Shine model, I haven't looked into them in a lot of detail, but my yeah, tell me if this is on point. My kind of base level understanding is that they've they've paired or own their own factories and garment production in China, and they've stitched that whole supply chain together, very similar to, to the way that Zara did it. Am I on the on the money or way off with them? As far as the the publicly available information, you've you've hit the nail on the head. I think none of us. They're such a secretive company that I think it's hard for any of us to be 100% sure, but I think there's been some investigative journalism that's come into it and said exactly that. And I think even even the likes of Walmart and some of the other major brands with global supply chain disruptions, they're going vertically integrated directly with their factories. They're even buying you know container ships so that they don't have to suffer at the hands of global supply chain shortages and challenges and problems. They're, they're buying container ships. They're buying containers. They're, they're buying berths and ports. They're they're doing crazy things, right, to, to get around the supply chain problem if they're mm. big enough. But I think what it sounds like you're saying is that Supply Compass brings elements of their sophistication to smaller brands that otherwise might not be able to afford it. Yeah, making it possible in a sim- similar, like, I draw a similar comparison to yeah, Amazon having their fleets of robots and then the brands that I work with at PeopleVox using PeopleVox. You know, it it gets you the same end result of everything going out on time, same day, eliminating all your picking mistakes. That same thing is needed. It's just where are this space is just much earlier in its in its in its sophistication and its prevalence. You know, there are still many brands that don't understand that collaboration with their suppliers is actually a key part to producing better product. They treat them very much as as suppliers rather than partners. What we've realized through our own digital outsourcing and through deploying the platform now for a year and a half is that if you can, in reaction to this massive increase in demand and all the tools and technology that exists to get super close to your customer, if you think about like how how close brands are like you mentioned all the customer data platforms how much they understand about their customers as this we're getting so good at that demand side there are now going to be like the first step is get the brand get closer to the manufacturer but ultimately the aim of that is to bring the manufacturer and the customer closer together so that you know, when you're getting when you're getting returns, for example, like you're getting returns on a particular style due to the sizing or due to the the way it fits or a component's not quite right or you know the color isn't as people expected from the photo. Being able to extend the feedback loop, like similar to what we've done with the sample loop, being able to extend the feedback loop to take that return information and share that back to the supplier so that they actually start to have an idea of what problems you're dealing with as a brand rather than having having them you know separated off in like this you know one two three steps for anything to get through and you get these kind of chinese whispers around that kind of thing yeah that that's kind of how we're thinking about it longer term rather than just thinking bring the bring the manufacturer in it's bring the manufacturer in so that you're actually bringing that whole piece together and i guess that also drives empathy both directions right it, it drives empathy for the brand from the from the factory and it drives empathy the, the other direction and ultimately like you say the customer uh, sorry the the brand becomes just a conduit uh, almost like a a pipe between the customer and the factory and they're facilitating the transaction they're facilitating uh, the experience actually more than the transaction. I think that's a real key is is that facilitation model. I, I'm seeing what you're seeing, which is that the brands that I'm working with and in, in particularly that the, do their own design, they the ones that treat their factories, even though they might not own those factories, um, but they treat them as true partners or they treat them as if as if they did own those factories. 
and they do bring them into the kimo- under the kimono of the brand, and they work totally collaboratively with them, albeit most of the time hampered by all the things that you've just mentioned, but where they make more of an effort to be collaborative with the factory and treat them instead of more like, you know, just this, this throwaway disposable labor source, when they treat them as more a critical piece of the brand experience itself um, and the beating heart of the business, then good things can happen. And is that part partnership mentality, you know, treat your, treat your partners as well as your customers and they'll look after you. And that, that's what really works in e-commerce as well, between the different vendors. And I'm sure within e-commerce brands, you know, from your consulting work and also when you've been on brand side, if you treat your partners well, and you treat them as partners when you're buying software from them, you get a much better service from them. You get looked after in a much better way. They talk to you about the new things that are happening. And there are all of these other kind of hidden second order advantages that start to come out of that. Um, and it's exactly the same with uh, with brands and their manufacturers. Totally awesome. Now, we're, we're, we're nearing the end of our time together. And I, and I so appreciate your time. And I, and I love the concept behind Supply Compass and where you guys are headed with this and what you're trying to do with it in the market and, and how you're trying to improve the entire brand experience around fashion um, right from right from concept and inception right through to it getting into the customer's hands and potentially even being returned at the end of it. If a merchant was to take on the whole suite of Supply Compass and kind of take on the whole model of Supply Compass, what would a product journey typically look like using the entire Supply Compass system? Great question. You're testing me here. So the starting point would be, well, the starting point will be that they'll they'll have ideas about what a future season is going to look like or a drop or a collaboration that they're going to launch. And they might start to collect together some different ideas, like visual ideas into one place. And they could use like these mood boards that we have. At the moment, most brands do that in Pinterest. So we think it's a really nice way to bring all of that initial kind of visual identity of what they're trying to put together into one place. So they build all of that out in the mood boards. The clever part of that, like this is where collaboration starts, is that even at that point, they can share mood board cards with the manufacturer. So the manufacturer can see like, oh, we're thinking about using a cut like this. Have you done anything like this before? And they could send that over. So they've not even drawn a design yet, but they're starting to talk to the manufacturer and work out whether they could work together on something. It's probably more common for like materials for that to be the start of the process. Then there's gonna be a, a process kind of external to Supply Compass, which is more of like the merchandising side, the planning of what they want to produce and the number of, like the number of garments. So they might say, we've got a $1 million sales target for this campaign. And that's gonna involve making 10 t-shirts, three pairs of jeans, five pairs of socks and two hats. And they're gonna know based on that those number of items, how that's gonna pan out in terms of sales roughly based on what they've done in the past. So they'll forward plan based on that. And then it will go over to the designers to say, hey designers, right now you need to design this these garments to meet these, you know, to meet the spec of this is the number we need to do. They'll tend to design that in Adobe Illustrator. Lots of them are not even as advanced as that. Many brands are using SketchUp, Procreate, whatever it is, they're designing in one spot and you know, coming up with what they want things to look like and then once they've got that kind of the visual design that then goes into supply compass and then from in there they'll have set up in there all of their dimensions you know they will have produced t-shirts in the past so they'll have a record of you know these are the t-shirt sizes that we need to make they'll have a record of all of the materials that they've used before or they can just create new materials to source and then they'll have uh, so they've done dimensions materials they'll put the sizes they want in against each of the garments then they'll decide right which factories do we want to put this out to so if they wanted they could build that initial tech pack and then using the platform they can go into costings send out the the tech pack digitally to their different manufacturers that are using the platform the manufacturers get the request for quote through they can have the cost negotiation within the platform of uh, or they could also come back on the tech pack and say mm, not really sure about this particular part of it could you clarify this for me so trying to drive a, a kind of a accountable way of organizing the costings between the two parties so they come to an agreement and that agreement may not be finalized but uh, right away, but they may then decide, let's go into sampling with a particular manufacturer. 
we're not 100 percent sure on the costings yet but let's start sampling so from that point they'll go through all of the styles that they put onto the platform they'll order samples you know they may depending on how brands do it whether they order like three or four rounds um or there's all different types i think there's about nine different types of sample set up within the platform and we even consider things like uh, a materials a sample which often isn't thought of like that but all of the all of the information and all of the spec related to the product that can then all be ordered and put into the sample order checkout they then click yep i want to order all those samples that all goes across to the factory they're then going to review all the samples decide yeah have that back and forth samples get shipped across there's then this feedback loop where the brand's going to sit in fit and feedback sessions you know actually like think about someone sat in a room like trying the dress on they've got a fit model in for the day and all the team are sat around they've got a fit model trying a dress on and they need to be able to take a photo and then quickly just take comments related to the fit session and our platform makes it really easy just to do that on an iPad. Um, you can even integrate like a Bluetooth tape measure for capturing the dimensions to make sure you're getting all of that information right. And then that feedback all gets collated, goes back over to the factory. You're then working towards this final tech pack and all the way through the process, the tech packs being automatically updated. There's no version history or so there's no versions that need to be created but there's a full history and an audit of everything that's happened. I'll take a breath. And then you end up with your uh, your final tech pack. And from that point, um, you can either raise a PO in your ERP or accounting platform and import that into Supply Compass, or you can create the, um, create the PO in the platform and send that over to the factory to do all of the ordering. Um, and then the thing, the glue really that sits across all of this is that from the point that they first created that style, you know, they put in the 10 t-shirts or two hats or three pairs of socks. We create something called a style thread, which is like a private WhatsApp chat against every single style. And that centralizes all the communication internally within the brand, all the document sharing, everything that goes on related to the style happens there. And that's also something that can be used externally to communicate back and forth with the factory. So we're centralizing all the communication and all of the history of everything that's going on. And then the kind of the third element to this is the whole critical path and specifically what this means is the dates of what is happening when that is then built out within our style tracker so the brand can see from that point of inception all the way through to the point of delivery what's happening when and who's responsible for it and that is then also accessible by their whole company you can take your style tracker or your critical path put it on a url and share that out to anyone in the business um, and that last bit i think is one of the most powerful parts of what we're doing because product sits at the core of a fashion brand like everything else marketing campaigns turning on your adwords again uh doing a photo shoot who should you pay money to when all your cash flow forecast that all depends on and revenue ultimately for getting the product that all depends on this product and where it is in its journey and whilst that critical path is a small part of what we do it's a huge part of what supply compass means to the company as a whole, rather than just that production and operations team. Wow. A good thing you gave me the short version. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Gave- that really is amazing. I do appreciate the the detail there. And I'm sure I'm sure listeners will, because, um, you know, regardless of whether, you know, a brand chooses to use supply compass or not, I try to try to avoid, you know, making it sound like it's a sales pitch for any 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 tech that I cover. But the reality is, is that brands have to figure out whether they use supply compass or something else, they have to figure out how to overcome this, particularly in the fashion space and that vertical. Um, and they've got to figure out how to bring the factories into the fold. They've got to treat them as true partners. Uh, I think the takeaway from all of this is the intentionality of brands uh, across every single thing that they do from design through the delivery to the customer and beyond, they actually have to do it with intention. Otherwise, mm-hmm. moving forward into the future, they're going to be marginalized as a brand most likely, particularly with consumers who are becoming increasingly, I guess, distrustful of, of brand BS in the market. Uh, mm-hmm. And they're becoming more demanding of where they spend their mo- of where they spend their money. And I think to me, that is the 
if I had to wrap up what you just said in a nutshell, that is to me the takeaway <laughs> is that is that you're building tools that have to be this complex and have to cover all these bases because that industry is complex to begin with. And customers are simply demanding more from brands than ever before. And that's not going to go away. It's only going to increase. I think you've definitely put it in more of a nutshell than me. I made it easy for you. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Look, how do, you know, if a brand is out there, let's say they're a fashion brand and, they, and they're, they're thinking about a new PLM or they're thinking about improving their processes or, or, or anything related to what we've talked about today, how do they get a hold of you? How do they get a hold of Supply Compass? Do they just go to, I think, it, I'm guessing it's, uh, in fact, I'm pretty sure it is, oh, it is, it's supplycompass.com. So I guess they go there, they jump on the live chat or they send you guys an email or um, I guess they can reach out to you directly. So uh, you tell me, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you if they, if they need I'm to? On, I'm on Oliver at supplycompass.com. If you reach out to me directly, say Jason sent you, that would be great. And then um, then we know that Jason and I hooking up like this is uh, is actually driving um, driving new leads into our business. That's definitely not the aim of, of coming on this and talking today. I'm, I'm hoping um, hoping Jason's picked up a lot about this new project that i'm working on and also you know getting your your expert view back on what we're doing is what's really interesting for me because it's another perspective yeah having your your ears wrapped around this for the last 50 minutes or so to get your perspective on what we're doing and how it fits in with the other trends and what other people are doing and how they're thinking about stuff in the market that's been super useful for me so aside from uh, talk, talking a lot and um and not managing to put things in a nutshell, I've actually picked up a significant amount of good insight. So yeah, thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Oh, absolutely, mate. It's my pleasure. And 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 same. You know, I you know I've I've teased around the in- edges of this a little bit in some projects recently that I've been involved in, but certainly not to the depth that you have. And yeah, I, I'm just I'm blown away by the complexity of the space. And and you know, I guess if you were just a consumer in a store and you just looked around and you saw a rack full of clothes, you probably wouldn't necessarily have the the uh, empathy or the appreciation for just how complex of an industry it is. And and when the consumer simply throws out, you know, throwaway lines like be more sustainable, it's kind of like, wow, uh, that, <laughs> that, that is such a it's almost a throwaway comment just because it's it's such a beast. It, it, the whole entire industry has so much momentum and has so much embedded, frankly, bullshit in it just because of the of the legacy, you know, because the making of clothes has been going on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And it's just evolved out of this almost archaic system of manufacturing and distributed work and and you know the globalization of manufacturing has meant that we've created these convoluted systems of moving stuff around the world uh and that's not going to change anytime soon so the reality is what you guys are doing is actually supremely important Mm -hmm. as brands try to get closer to their customer uh in areas that actually matter to them so you just before you wrap up you just made me think about it in another way from the way you've just outlined it there think about this even from a farming perspective the old way is you knew where all your food came from because you grew it in your garden or you got it from someone down the road and that meant you were connected to it and you understood its journey and you knew where it came from that was the old way you had relationships with the people that you bought stuff from new way of manufacturing to support this increase in speed and demand has been that people have moved towards a transactional model where the person that's buying something isn't connected to the person that's making it. And all we're really looking to do is take things back round to the old way of connecting the two parties together again. I- I've thought of the perfect tagline for you guys. You are farm to table for fashion. Like it. Yeah. I won't even charge you for that one, man. I won't even charge you. I'm going to log into the website now and just change it out. Change it out. <laughs> Farm to table. That's it. That's what you are. Look, mate, it is. it has truly been a pleasure. It's always a pleasure chatting to you. Uh, you're a deep thinker and you're a powerful force in our industry. And I love being your mate. And I love working with you and, you know, being involved in stuff, even just watching from afar. It's super cool. And I'm, I'm super glad that you've landed where you've landed. Uh, after after a decade, you know, at People Fox and Supply Chain, you've landed in a pretty cool spot, and I'm 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 watching closely, man. And uh, look, I think you're inspirational to a lot of people out there. And um, you know, keep keep doing what you're doing because uh, you're having a bigger impact than maybe sometimes you think. Sweet dude, appreciate that. Thanks for listening to the At the Coalface podcast. If you want more At the Coalface, you can subscribe to our premium e-commerce and digital newsletter, At the Coalface Digest. 